Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to those here today and those following along online. I'm Rob Litvak, Senior Vice President and uh, Director of International Security Studies at the Wilson Center. I would also like to welcome, I would like to welcome all of you to uh, another installment of the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum. Launched in September 2015, uh, the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum is a best-in-class platform for bringing together business, political, and academic leaders around key economic, trade, and investment issues in Africa and in U.S.-Africa economic relations. The previous events in the series have been very successful and informative, uh, covering topics ranging from the role of sovereign wealth, wealth funds in Africa's sustainable development to the importance of supply chains uh, for trade in Africa. We live in a world of complex national, regional, and global development and economic challenges here at the Wilson Center. We seek to address these critical global challenges, providing analysis to inform policymaking and offer strategic uh, actionable uh, uh, solutions. The Wilson Center stays connected with developments in Africa and strives to address key issues impacting Africa and U.S.-Africa relations. The discussions facilitated through the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum uh, embody this mission. Since its launch, the forum has served as a venue for dialogue on critical issues, and today we will continue in that tradition with an expert panel that brings together viewpoints from multiple sectors on Africa's fast-evolving economic relations with Brazil, India, the Gulf States, Turkey, and Japan. Uh, while the high volumes of trade between Africa and the European Union, China, and the United States have gotten much play uh, in government and, and policy-making circles, academic circles, increasingly some less traditional partners are establishing significant economic and business relationships with the continent. For example, according to the African Development Bank, India is now the fourth <coughs> biggest bilateral trade partner with Africa. The Gulf states, which have long had relationships with North Africa, have been widening the scope of their engagement southwards and towards non-oil trade as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Further, uh, countries like Japan have shifted some of their focus from aid towards trade and development projects. Uh, Dr. Mande Moangwa will introduce them later, but I wanted to quickly highlight the great expertise uh, that's reflected in today's panel. We have speakers researching these important issues, uh, business and trade relationships from academia, uh, private sector, and multilateral institutions. Uh, we sincerely thank the panelists uh, for sharing their time and expertise and look forward to their contributions to the discussion. I'd also like to thank um, uh, two longtime friends of the Wilson Center whose generosity of this Africa Forum has allowed us to be at the cutting edge of discussions of Africa, African economic and business relations. Mr. Eddie and Ms. Sylvia Brown, um, uh, who are both uh, w Wilson Center cabinet members and who have provided invaluable um, support to the Africa program in particular and to the Wilson Center at large over the years. Delighted that uh, Mr. Brown can, can be with us today. You'll hear from him in a few minutes. I would also like to acknowledge members of the uh, African and International Diplomatic Corps, uh, representatives from the government, uh, from governmental, private, uh, NGO, and academic sectors, and uh, members of the African uh, Africa Program Advisory, the Africa Program's Advisory Council, who are in attendance today. We're thankful uh, for the support of all of these parties uh, to the Wilson Center and to the Africa Program. Finally, I thank you know Dr. Monde Mwangwa, uh, who's director of the Africa uh, Center's Africa Program, and her really superb team who've mounted today's uh, uh, function. Amande is a great asset to the, Wil to, the, to the Africa program and to the Wilson Center. She's one of our rock stars. And I'm happy uh, that uh, to participate uh, in today's uh, uh, proceedings. Uh, and with that, uh, let me turn the floor over uh, to uh, Mr. Eddie Brown for opening remarks. <coughs> Thanks. Hello, everyone. Hello. Everyone awake? Yes. Ready to go? Great. Thank you, Dr. Litvak, Dr. Moyangwa, distinguished speakers and guests, and to all of you 
uh, the audience for being here today. I'm Eddie Brown, founder, chairman, and CEO of Brown Capital Management. At Brown Capital, we greatly appreciate your continued support and interest in the Africa Forum events hosted by our partners, the Wilson Center Africa Program. Through this forum and series of events, we strive to expand the discussion of critical economic and development issues in Africa, bringing both challenges and opportunities to the forefront of policy discussions and conversations. Today, we hope to continue in this effort, focusing on a topic that deserves more attention. Africa's relationship with key economic and business partners outside of the big three, the European Union, China, and the United States. With this event, we hope to spotlight the changing dynamics and relationships that African countries are forging with Brazil, India, the Gulf states, Turkey, and Japan, as well as the potential opportunities to set the stage for mutually beneficial trade and development going forward. Again, thank you to the Africa Program, the Wilson Center, to our distinguished speakers, and you, the audience, for all of your support of the Brown Capital Management Africa Forum at the Wilson Center for joining us today for this event. I will now turn it over to our distinguished, often praised, Dr. Moyangwa, director of the Africa Program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown, and uh, thank you, Dr. Litvak. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to join Mr. Brown and Dr. Litvak in welcoming you all to this Brown Capital Management Africa Forum event. I will be your moderator for this event, and I also want to welcome all of those following on our webcast, Facebook live stream, and on Twitter. To those of you joining us on Twitter, you can follow us at the Africa Program's Twitter account, Africa Up Close and contribute to the discussion using the hashtag at Africa Trade Partners, all one word. We're especially delighted to be hosting this event that looks beyond the big three, as was mentioned, to take a more critical look at the expanding economic relationships that Africa has with the rest of the world, with a specific focus on Brazil, India, the Gulf states, Turkey, and Japan. I think it's especially poignant that we are holding this event on the 4th of April, the day on which Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated 50 years ago. For me, and I know for many others, it's an opportunity to reflect on and give thanks to Dr. King for his fight for justice and equality and to take stock of what has been accomplished since and more importantly, to recommit to the struggle that still lies ahead. Some of you know that Dr. King also stood for and with Africa on the issues of justice and equality as a continent battled colonialism. And for this African-born child, that is a particular point of pride. And his legacy remains very strong in Africa. If you have not done so, I'd encourage you to read his sermon, The Birth of a New Nation, which he gave on April 7, 1957, after he returned from Ghana's independence celebrations. In that sermon, Dr. King talked about the promise of an independent Ghana, including through economic management to stabilize and grow the economy and to build the human capacity to augment the freedom and justice that had just been attained through independence. That is a dream that Dr. King had for Ghana and for Africa in general. And as I reread that sermon last night, I wondered how and whether Africa's various economic relationships, some of which we're going to discuss today, are moving the continent towards the fulfillment of that promise and that dream. To this end, we have a 
excellent panel to help us understand what Brazil, India, the Gulf states, and Turkey, and Japan are doing in the economic realm with Africa. To understand the nature and extent of their economic engagement with the continent, as well as the drivers of that engagement and prospects for the future. So as we look at these new consolidated and economic and, ex and expanding economic uh, relationships, we also need to consider the geostrategic, political, and security considerations and the other interests that lie behind um, that engagement. We also want to look at how the drivers might intersect or diverge with those of other international actors, including and perhaps especially the big three. And we also want to understand and describe the policies and institutional infrastructures that these countries have developed to support their economic engagement with the African continent. And because we're always focused on the future, each of our speakers has also been asked to put forward two to three actionable recommendations for Africa and our international partners to more effectively leverage these economic and business opportunities. So with that as a backdrop, let me now introduce our speakers, and I'll do so in the order in which they will speak. In the interest of time, I'm going to give just a short introduction of each speaker. Their full bios can be found in your program. We have asked each of them to speak for no more than 10 minutes, answering the questions that I just outlined from the perspective of the country or region on which they're <laughs> the expert. So first, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Ellen. I cannot produce, uh, pronounce her Turkish last name. She told me that Turks also have a difficult time pronouncing it, so she's given me the permission to call her Dr. Ellen. She's a member of, facul of the faculty at the International Law Implementation and Research Center at Yasa University in Turkey. She has published extensively on the relationship between Turkey and Africa, and as you can see, she's joining us remotely via video. And I know <laughs> it's very late in Turkey and that you have a young child on your hands as well, so we greatly appreciate uh, the time that you are taking to join us for this uh, discussion. Our second speaker will be Dr. Subir Gokhan. He is the Executive Director for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Sri Lanka at the International Monetary Fund. He is the former Director of Research for Brookings India, as well as the former Deputy Governor for the Reserve Bank of India. He too has published extensively on India's relation, relations and engagement with the rest of the world, including with Africa, and so he will focus on the India piece. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Our third speaker will be Mr. Peyton Knopf, who is the co coordinator of the South Sudan Senior Working Group at the United States Institute for Peace. He's also a former U.S. diplomat, and he focuses his scholarship on the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. Today, he will address the trends of economic engagement between the Gulf states and Africa, and I want to especially thank Peyton for making the time to join us on such short notice, as we had a lot of moving parts on this particular region, so thank you so much. Then our fourth speaker will be Mr. Carlton Jones, who is the Africa Agricultural Leader at Detro Deloitte, based out of the Dar es Salaam Tanzania offices. He will be addressing Africa's economic and business relationship with Japan and leveraging the expertise through his work with Deloitte and other research on business and trade uh, in Africa. We had a very busy schedule in Tanzania, but he was so committed to joining us that he literally just got off a plane earl earlier a few hours ago, so thank you so much, Carlton. We appreciate it. And then our fifth, but certainly not our, the least of our speakers this afternoon, is Dr. Christina Stoltis, who is an assistant professor at Frederick Alexander University <coughs> in Germany. She is a specialist in Latin American studies who has published widely on relations between Brazil and Africa, and we're absolutely delighted uh, to, to have you here this afternoon. So each of our speakers, again, will also prepare 10-minute remarks after which we'll open it to a Q&A after all of the speakers have spoken. So with that, Dr. Gohan, your 10 minutes start now. I thought you were going to press Dr. it. Sorry, Sorry. you are absolutely <coughs> right. Dr. Allen, you go first. All right. Yay. Are you Thank ready? you, Dr. Sorry? All right, we have a problem. IT. All right, I can hear you right now. <laughs> 
sorry, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but we cannot hear you. So what we're going to do oh. is we'll go to Dr. Gokhan while our mm -hmm. IT team uh, fixes the situation. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Okay. Gokhan, you want to go? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muyangawa. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to share my thoughts. I have to uh, be uh, somewhat candid here and say that I do not fit the description of an expert on Africa. Uh, my uh, interest in the Indo-African relationship began as part of a collective effort when I was in Brookings to try and provide some perspective on what was then the third Indo-African summit in uh, October of 2015. Uh, so a group of us uh, tried to channelize a range of expertise and, and perspectives on the bilateral or the, re the re regional relationship, I can hardly call it bilateral. Uh, and uh, since my focus was economics, I tried to put get some perspective on the broader macro trends and also uh, get into dialogues with people who are doing business, uh, Indians who are doing business with Africa and so on. Uh, after coming to the fund, obviously one has a uh, much wider sort of bird's eye view of uh, what is going on in the continent and its relationships with uh, other parts of the world. Uh, so I'll try and pool these two perspectives and provide some uh, indications of, of uh, the context for the Indo-African relationship and also uh, the way forward and hopefully answer all of the questions uh, to some extent in my remarks. Uh, I think the context uh, for the, uh, or the context of the relationship is very important uh, as a way to understand what has been going on and the opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, this is, a, uh, obviously when we talk of Africa, we tend to uh, to talk of the aggregate, and I think that's quite, uh, you know, misleading at times. It is, after all, over 50 countries in the continent, each one with its own history uh, and legacies, institutions, and so on. Uh, and yet we tend to simplify by aggregating. I'll, I'll often fall into that trap, but I hope uh, not to any great detriment to my perspectives. Uh, but the Indo-African relationship uh, is longstanding. Uh, we have uh, over 2 million people of Indian origin uh, spread across uh, several African countries, and uh, many of them have been there for, for several generations. Uh, it's often said that they're more African, their links with, the, uh, India, with India have, have weakened over the years. Uh, but I think over the last 25, 30, maybe 40 years, and I think perhaps the Ugandan situation when a number of, uh, well, well, the, the whole Indian population was essentially exiled uh, or expelled, uh, has changed circumstances and the Indo-African relationship at a people-to-people -people level, I think, has been growing stronger over this period. And that has created one sort of platform, one basis uh, for uh, stronger business and trade relationships because a large part of this population uh, essentially are motivated by trade, their livelihoods still uh, derive from trading and entrepreneurship activities. Uh, but there have been other relation or other basis of the relationship as well. Uh, in the aftermath of Indian independence in the 50s, the, the post-colonial regime, uh, Indian foreign policy was uh, certainly focused on creating solidarity between newly independent countries, and Africa was a big part of that. Uh, so a number of development uh, relationships, institution-building relationships that developed then. We had a movement which most people seem to have forgotten about now called the non-aligned movement which in which Africa and India were a big a big part of. Uh, so that's sort of, let's say, ideological linkage. That's the solidarity of the, the third world, if you will, was a big part of the larger Indian foreign policy context. Uh, there have been a number of, and I, I find this very striking when I meet people of African origin in the US, uh, in Washington, uh, and I tell them I'm from India. Uh, many of them recollect being taught uh, English and mathematics by, by Indian teachers. And this spreads across a number of countries. And this is a very sort of uh, little known, I think, aspect of the bilateral relationship, but a very, very important one in terms of developing the sort of softer side of the uh, diplomatic relationship. And finally, the perspective on peacekeeping. India is a very big participant in UN peacekeeping processes in Africa. None of these uh, relationships have been very smooth and 
uh, stable, but they're important, they're complex, and I think to a large extent they're robust. So based on this, what is the current state of the business relationship? Uh, the most visible manifestation of this is uh, what are called lines of credit, uh, which is essentially the Indian government through its ex Export-Import Bank, or Exim Bank as it's called, uh, lending bilaterally to African countries, uh, enabling them to make investments, enabling them to buy uh, equipment, materials, services from India, which is the standard model for bilateral aid. Now, uh, the amount outstanding right now, perhaps somewhere between six and a half and seven billion dollars, uh, we are starting to see some uh, some stress on, on repayments and so on in the larger context of uh, African debt. Uh, but uh, uh, this has be been an expanding phenomenon in the past uh, few years. And uh, the idea that Africa offers a new opportunity uh, for Indian business and as yet fully unexploited, uh, all of this has driven this sort of business uh, of finance-driven strategy uh, over the last few years. A number of large Indian businesses have actually made investments. The most visible is the telecom investment uh, when an Indian company, uh, Airtel, uh, took over uh, Kuwait Telecom's investments in Zain, and it, 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 it is in about 16 or 17 countries. Uh, there is a fair amount of investment in cultivation in, in Ethiopia from a company called Karuturi. Uh, so these individual initiatives are taking shape, uh, but there hasn't been so far a very significantly integrated state-private sector partnership, a public-private partnership uh, looking at business opportunities in, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, so at this point, I think we're in a state of transition uh, where uh, over the last few years, Indian economic diplomacy has moved from being sort of somewhat case by case ad hoc to now more strategic in nature, uh, being called the Development Partnership Program. And the foreign ministry has now created a separate sort of uh, structure for development partnerships. I think this is the way forward. This is how uh, the relationship between this very heterogeneous set of countries in uh, in Africa and uh, India is going to develop because ultimately I think the success or the robustness of these strategies depends on an effective public-private partnership. So we're looking at a scenario where the state provides uh, certain resources, certain capabilities, and I also already mentioned that we have a legacy of this through teaching, through, through education, through healthcare, and so on. Uh, and this is then combined with the willingness of the private sector to take advantage of business opportunities in the region. Uh, we are very big importers of raw materials from Africa. We are relatively big uh, suppliers of mostly consumer goods, but now increasingly capital goods. So that's the growth in trade that was referred to in the earlier remarks. Uh, let me then conclude by talking about the way forward in, in strategic terms. I think the, uh, the classic strategic paradigm that we have to look at here is precisely the, the, the framing of this session, which is if you're in a game where there are some big players and some small players, how best do you optimize uh, your, your outcomes being one of the small players? I think the key to Indian strategy in the, in the African region, which is still evolving, still being talked about, and, and hopefully taking shape in some form as we go along, is to leverage, is niching, is essentially what is the best niche that you can occupy as a small player. You cannot compete with the three uh, big players that were mentioned, so how do you take advantage of the niches that you have? And here I think the context that I mentioned, which is the, the diasporic relationship, uh, the longstanding sort of cultural or soft uh, skill, uh, soft diplomacy, uh, and uh, the ability to be nimble in terms of exploiting certain opportunities which larger scale activities may not cover. I think these are the three uh, elements of a niche, niching strategy, and I think that's the way that uh, the thinking in India about how to take, how to remain in a player, remain in force, uh, but accepting that uh, these are these, these three gigantic relationships which you're really not going to be competing with uh, anytime soon. So that's uh, from the Indian side, I think from the African side, the perspective has to be similar. That is, what are the particular kinds of advantages that uh, interacting with uh, Indian capacity, uh, knowledge, uh, innovation, institutions that support these. Education is a big, big uh, linkage, and I think that's something which uh, needs to be exploited. And secondly, where can India complement other initiatives, uh, perhaps in partnership with other countries, but also perhaps more broadly, as was referred to, the African Development Bank, 
uh, getting embedded in terms of resources, in terms of skills, uh, expertise into larger multilateral initiatives. So I think that's, that's probably the most effective way in which the bilateral relationship can flourish. Uh, I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gokharan. <laughs> Dr. Elbertheim, can you hear me? I guess not. All yeah, right. I hear you quite well, yeah. actually. Is oh, all right. We can hear you now. You hear me now? Yes. Uh, why don't you go ahead and talk to us about Turkey as economic engagement with Africa around the four questions that we sent you? All right. Thanks a lot for the invitation as well, and thank you for making all those arrangements of video conferencing. Um, Africa actually now occupies an important place in Turkish foreign policy. And as the Turkish government started to attach more importance in developing relations with African countries, uh, trade relations with those countries also increased. Uh, but Africa for Turkey is actually a new area and it was not always, this interest was not always there. And it is the result of many interrelated factors, which I will talk about later on in more detail. But it was mainly after the adoption of the uh, action plan for opening up the Africa in late 1990s. And after this state, and especially after uh, early 2000s, um, trade with African countries has started to increase, uh, but uh, although trade with Africa is on the rise, it is still below the expected levels. Uh, but on the other hand, many Turkish companies have started to invest in different African countries, and they, these Turkish uh, enterprises, especially small and medium-sized companies, um, they now see that Africa can offer them uh, more opportunities um, in order to meet their economic interests. And in their search for more business uh, opportunities in the continent, uh, the direct investments of those Turkish companies have reached uh, $6 billion in 2016. So we see that different internal and external um, factors are driving Turkey's economic engagement in Africa. Uh, Turkey actually started diplomatic relations with sub-Saharan African countries in 1960s and 1970s. Um, it already had close relations with Northern African countries dating back to the Ottoman Empire, but um, relations with sub-Saharan Africa is actually new. And it is actually... it. it the decision to develop relations with those countries uh, was actually done to have their support uh, for its foreign policy actions as the Cyprus issue. And this foreign policy activism uh, continued during 1980s and 1990s, um, especially under the leadership of Turgut Özal, who sought to liberalize Turkish economy and integrate it with world markets. And to this end, Turkey approached Middle East countries and as, as well as the newly independent states in Central Asia, Caucasia and Balkans. Um, and during this period, also a new bourgeoisie, uh, which is also defined as conservative bourgeoisie or Anatolian tigers, uh, that emerged during this liberalization wave of 1980s, they began to push uh, for the opening up to new markets. And this new class soon began to have uh, more importance in foreign policy making. Um, but some internal factors like the financial crisis, political instability and lack of um, economic crisis and lack of financial resources, they impeded the development, the, the implementation of this action plan for opening to Africa until uh, the Justice and Development Party assumed power in 2002. And having bought the political will, and the necessary financial resources, uh, the Justice and Development Party continued this foreign policy activism, uh, especially in once neglected regions, including Africa. So the Justice and Development Party uh, has assumed a new role, a greater role for Turkey in both regional and world politics, uh, with its engagement with African countries being an important part of this new foreign policy vision. And the Justice and Development Party uh, has used, and, and the party is still using humanitarian aid and development assistance um, as a means to develop its relations with African countries, uh, which, which in turn complement um, Turkey's commercial interests. 
um, I mean, Turkey's aid activities have facilitated also its commercial expansion in the continent. Um, and not only public institutions, but also um, non-governmental organizations and business groups, they also help to implement this opening policy. Uh, I mean, they, uh, their aid activities in different African countries um, have helped to enhance Turkey's image and Turkey's presence uh, in Africa. And the party also using other agencies like Turkish Airlines. Um, Turkish Airlines having flights to 40 destinations in nearly 30 African countries um, also uh, supported the African opening policy of the government. And um, more importantly, it increased the accessibility of Africa to Turkish businessmen and vice versa. Um, but an important tension point has lately been on Turkish schools, uh, while a possible area of collaboration manifests itself in the uh, humanitarian field. An important part of Turkey's engagement is Africa is uh, in Africa is the contribution of non-state actors. This this NGO presence is actually very visible in the Turkish context. And both public institutions and NGOs uh, and business groups as well. Those business groups support uh, the aid activities of those NGOs in order to increase their commercial expansion, of course. And both public institutions and NGOs, they work in high risk areas and they provide direct aid. Uh, in contrast to Africa's traditional partners that generally implement their acti aid activities via local NGOs or international aid organizations. And Turkish aid generally comes with no strings attached. So this humanitarian approach is uh, the very um, the very approach that the, aid, the, the Justice and Development Party is using to uh, approach African countries and increase uh, commercial relations with those countries. But on the other hand, uh, an important tension point has lately been on Turkish schools. Um, those schools were initially opened by, you know, the Gulen movement in late 1990s, uh, but the organization has been um, later defined as a terrorist organization under the assigned name Gulenist Terror Organization, uh, abbreviated as FETO. And um, after the following um, split, the recent split between the government and the movement, um, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who was the prime minister then, he called on African leaders and uh, asked them to close those schools and replace, in order to replace them with government-sponsored ones. And in 2016, uh, the government also established Mari Foundation, and the foundation was given the sole authority uh, to establish Turkish schools, apart from the Ministry of National Education, to establish Turkish schools abroad. Um, at first, only a few African countries has responded to Erdogan's call, and many of them, the majority of those African countries, have expressed their support for those schools. Uh, but the, as of early 2018, uh, we see that the foundation assumed the control of 70 schools in 16 African countries, and it has signed agreements with other 10 African countries. But on the other hand, we see that those schools still operate in important African countries as Algeria, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania. But in order to set the stage for mutually beneficial trade and development, uh, I believe that co cooperation in the energy sector, uh, benefiting from each other's market potential, and cooperation in fighting uh, terrorism would be of great help. Um, because Turkey can cooperate with African countries in the energy sector because you know Turkey is nearly absent in this area and as a country uh, being highly dependent on outside sources to meet its increasing uh, energy demand uh, Turkey the uh, border cooperation with African countries can help Turkey to diversify its source countries and while African countries can also benefit from Turkish initiatives as Turkey creates employment and investments and uh, Turkey employs local staff, uh, unlike, uh, for example, China that recruits his own people. Uh, for example, according to the data provided by the Minister of Turkish Foreign Affairs, in 2015, Turkish companies provided employment for 30,000 people in Ethiopia, uh, which is the largest number of workers employed by a foreign country in Ethiopia. Uh, and Africa can also provide Turkey um, 
an alternative market, especially following the deterioration of relations with Turkey's traditional trade partners and, um, you know, this um, new class, this conservative bourgeois that pushed up for the opening to the new markets uh, in 1980s and 1990s. Um, they also look for alternative markets and Africa is an important uh, area in this field. On the other hand, as for Africa, uh, Turkey can be a gateway for the markets in France and the Middle East located in Turkey's immediate neighborhood. And uh, lastly, I believe that Turkey should cooperate with African countries in their fight with terrorism. Uh, because there are many African countries that are affected by terrorist attacks and as a country being in a long-standing battle uh, with terrorist organizations, both on legal and military terms. Uh, terrorist organizations like PKK, ISIS, etc. Turkey can help African countries in their fight with terrorism and uh, military cooperation with Turkey having significant uh, military capabilities and experience. Uh, might also help African countries to develop their capabilities in this field. Um, and such a cooperation might also contribute to the development of commercial relations as well. Okay. Uh, President Erdogan himself emphasized, emphasized in this many different occasions that Turkey is ready to help African countries in their fight with terrorism. So I see it as a very important area and the last area uh, for cooperation where both sides can mutually benefit from each other's experience. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Dr. Allen. We, we appreciate that. Uh, we had a little bit of a lag here, so what I'm just going to do is very quickly hit about five key points that I think I heard from you, just so uh, the audience and um, the rest of us can be thinking about questions and um, for you afterwards. So I think part of what I heard you say was um, Turkey developed a very deliberate strategy for Africa in 2005 but that that strategy of opening up Africa was not implemented due to a variety of things that were happening at home, including the economic crisis, and I think that was also the time that there um, was the earthquake or something, if I recall correctly, uh, but a lot of stuff that was mm -hmm. going on at home, uh, and so the strategy actually was Im wasn't implemented until the 1990s. The second point that I heard you talk about was that trade uh, is actually below the expected levels, but that it's growing, and that yes. Turkey's infrastructure goes beyond the apparatus of the state uh, to include um, NGOs and schools and others in terms of supporting uh, its um, efforts to expand economically across the continent. Uh, I think you mentioned that Turkey now flies to about 30 African countries, and if I recall correctly, I heard somebody say that um, The, um, the head uh, of the party has visited, Turkey, has visited Africa at least 30 times, uh, 30 different yep. trips to Africa since 2005 to 23 different countries. So we, we, we do see that. Uh, but I think you also raise an important uh, fact that some of the fights that's going, uh, the issues that are going at home, the contentious issues at home, are also playing out in Africa uh, with regard to these Gulen schools and how uh, that's being uh, play, playing out in Africa right now. Um, so I think that's a, big, uh, that's a big point. And then you identified at least three potential areas for collaboration, uh, the energy sector, um, cooperation around uh, terrorism, fighting terrorism, and I can't remember what the third one was. I can't read my own handwriting. But those were at least two that you, that, that you raised. So I think those are some good entry points for all of us to engage with Dr. Elam. Um, when the time comes. Let me turn it over to our next speaker, Peyton. Thank you very much, uh, Monday, and thanks very much to the Wilson Center for having me here uh, today. Um, I'm an, I was asked to speak a little bit about um, Gulf uh, economic relations uh, with Africa, and I'm gonna concentrate uh, specifically on the horn, uh, as you alluded to in your opening uh, remarks, uh, and even more specifically on the sort of political and security dynamics that are underlying uh, the economic relationships between the Gulf states uh, and the Horn of Africa, um, and, and some recent sort of developments in that regard. So um, just a few observations to kind of set this context and, and take a step back. Um, I think what you one of the primary sort of trend lines that you've seen uh, in the last couple of years is that the United States is no longer 
the primary security guarantor uh, in the Horn of Africa and, and the broader Red Sea region. And I should have prefaced my remarks by saying uh, I'm with the U.S. Institute of Peace, and we're trying to take a much um, broader uh, look at these issues as sort of uh, not as bifurcated between the Horn and, and the Gulf, but as a broader Red Sea region as a more coherent political and security uh, entity. So some of what you'll hear me talk about today reflects that kind of conceptual uh, approach. Um, so you've seen the U.S. Uh, in contrast to the preceding decades not uh, no longer be the, the main political and security guarantor in the region. Um, and one of the things that's then developed out of that is you've seen uh, the militarization of the broader Red Sea, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like uh, in practice, but, um, but it's a significant shift, in fact, from uh, even where we were, uh, you know, five, six years ago. Um, what you've also seen uh, more recently uh, in the last year is that uh, the rift within the GCC uh, and between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and, and Egypt on the one hand and Qatar on the other hand uh, is not limited uh, to, uh, to the Gulf. It's in fact uh, very much impacted uh, the political and security dynamics on the other side of the Red Sea in the Horn and that contest has in fact been exported uh, to the Horn by the Gulf states uh, across the board with real ramifications for the calculations of the governments uh, in the Horn of Africa and uh, of, of other external uh, actors. Um, you've also seen uh, beyond just the rift within the GCC and the, and the issue with Qatar, uh, the war in Yemen uh, have a significant influence again on political and security considerations on both sides of the Red Sea. Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, you've seen both of those dynamics intersect with an increasingly uh, intense competition over uh, the Nile uh, between Egypt and Sudan uh, and Ethiopia. And so this has created quite uh, a volatile uh, political and security picture um, and into which these economic relations and sort of calculations of the various uh, states play into that. Just maybe to underscore the point uh, in, in a slightly more precise uh, kind of anecdote, uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in literally a 72 hour period, you had the Egyptian foreign minister uh, in Juba, the capital of South Sudan. You had the Qatari foreign minister uh, in Khartoum. You had the Somali president on his way to Doha, and you had an Emirati delegation traveling throughout Somalia, uh, meeting with the various heads of the regional states. And I think just that snapshot sort of underscores both the complexity of, of what we're dealing with here at a, on a political and security and economic level, um, but also um, sort of how uh, what traditionally we saw as kind of patterns uh, uh, of interactions between these states uh, has really shifted just in the last um, couple of years. So let me speak briefly about sort of what my observations about what is underlying calculations on the Gulf side and then the Horde side, and then I'll offer uh, a few uh, recommendations uh, to, to wrap up my remarks. So. Um, on the Gulf side, I think what you, what's animating uh, their interactions, political, security, and economic, uh, in the Horn of Africa um, is certainly economic self-interest uh, and, and wanting to explore new markets and investments. But what you're also seeing is, uh, is uh, an attempt by all of the states in the Gulf to build a new security architecture that they believe responds to their, their perception of the, the, the uh, shifting threat environment. Um, and this is not something that just began in the last year. I think to take one example, if you go back a couple of years, there was a concerted effort by, uh, by the United Arab Emirates and by Saudi Arabia to shift Sudan uh, out of uh, its uh, close relationship with Iran and more towards uh, a stronger relationship with the Sunni states. Um, even more recently, you have seen uh, a concerted uh, and, uh, and um, clearly planned effort by the Emirates to build um, uh, sort of a linked chain, not just of ports, um, but of security uh, bases throughout the region, right? So, um, and that is in direct response to whatever they've assessed their needs to be, not just with respect to Iran, um, but I think also, uh, and one of the things that underlies a lot of these, these political and security calculations is a debate within the Gulf about the role of political Islam and governance, um, not just in the Gulf, but again, uh, in the Horn, and, and how these states perceive that either as a threat or not, uh, to their long-term uh, long interests. 
What that's led to, however, is uh, as the as the rift within the Gulf has um, has unfolded over the last you know, year, um, you've seen that contest playing out as a zero sum game in the horn. Uh, you're either with one side of the of the fight or you're against it, um, and that has had very detrimental impact on the states uh, of the horn, and in fact reinforced uh, some fairly negative uh, dynamics that existed there uh, already. Um, I think. You know, in my view, and I, I think I'm not alone in this, uh, the fact remains that no one actor is going to be able to dominate the, the political and security environment in the region, right? So what this sets up is uh, increased fragmentation in an already fractious uh, environment, right? And there's not a way, I mean, it may be perceived as a zero-sum game. No, it's a zero-sum game that no single state can win. Um, and so I, I think that's a fairly sobering picture um, uh, looking forward. Um, and unfortunately, what it creates is uh, a sort of clientelistic approach uh, that the Gulf is pursuing uh, in the Horn of Africa. On the Horn side, um, I would say that uh, much of what is animating um, those states' uh, interactions with the Gulf uh, is a very sort of retail relationship. Uh, depending on the state, it's, uh, it's tied directly to regime um, survival. There are certainly uh, have been some uh, significant economic success stories in the Horn of Africa. Ethiopia is one, certainly, in terms of uh, uh, its economic growth over the last um, several decades. But you're still dealing with a region that is extremely volatile, as I don't have to tell anyone else in this room, uh, uh, not particularly stable, states that are not particularly uh, well governed, not effectively governed, very uh, still institutions that are uh, have a good distance to go. And so um, what you see then is as the states try to pursue these sort of retail relationships with the Gulf, they're not done in a necessarily strategic fashion that is, um, that is promoting stability. And as I alluded to earlier, in fact, the way these interactions play out uh, I think is, is fomenting even more instability uh, in the long term. Um, I think, and, and here I'll, I'll just uh, sort of give credit where credit is due, the European envoy, uh, special envoy for the Horn of Africa, a man named Alex Rondos, has spoken very consistently and eloquently about the fact that the only way that the states of the Horn um, can break this kind of cycle of a retail kind of clientelistic relationship with the Gulf is by greater regional integration within the Horn. And I think that's exactly right. Now, there are no shortage of challenges to that happening, right? Not least um, the sort of status of Eritrea and, and, and other issues. But, um, but at the end of the day, I think certainly for those of us uh, who are not from the region looking at these issues, um, if, there is a, um, if there is going to be successful effort in promoting stability, uh, in, in reducing insecurity in the region, in creating an, an investment, uh, an economic climate that is more conducive to external investment, it is really going to have to come about as a result of greater regional integration. And there is some, uh, there's a lot uh, distance to go uh, between where we are now and then, but I think it's a prerequisite to a fundamental change in, in kind of the economic uh, environment. So let me just wrap up by offering a couple of, uh, as you had asked Monday, uh, sort of offering a couple of, of recommendations. Uh, and here I'm going to kind of focus, since we're in Washington, we're at the Wilson Center on uh, kind of what the United States can do to, to, to address uh, some of these issues and, uh, and, um, and you know, hopefully promote uh, a slightly more uh, stable environment uh, in the Horn. Um, as I said, I think you have a situation right now, the United States uh, alone uh, spends about $5 billion a year in the Horn of Africa across development, humanitarian, uh, security, and peacekeeping uh, assistance. It is the, uh, the region has more peacekeeping missions and more peacekeeping personnel than any other region on the planet, which I think again underscores the, the fragility of the, of the sort of area that we're talking about here. Um, but what is noticeably absent is a coherent uh, U.S. political strategy uh, for the Red Sea region. And I think it's very hard to see, again, uh, even a more uh, sustainable long-term economic uh, investment approach uh, occurring without a commensurate uh, um, investment by the United States uh, in concert with, its, with other uh, external actors. Um, 
to uh, to look at the politics of the region as they are and, and update its own sort of thinking and, and interaction in that regard. Now, there's a particular challenge, and I'm uh, obviously following uh, our Turkish colleague and others, and we're talking about the big three, in that when you look at sort of U.S. policy in general uh, and the way our policy structures work, and this is not unique to the United States, I think it's true of a number of other countries as well, um, and then you look at the different dynamics that are interplaying, it basically involves a holistic approach that bureaucracies are not all that good at, uh, at constructing, right? Because when you look at some of the issues that I've just uh, sort of uh, spoken about, you have, uh, you have to bring in the people who do the Middle East, you have to bring in the people who do uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you have to bring in the people who do Europe, not just because of our sort of traditional uh, Western European partners, but because of uh, the role of Turkey uh, in this region, increasingly assertive role that Turkey is playing. Um, and then, of course, you have the role of China and others. You've got to bring in the Asia people. And that takes a lot more uh, coordination than I think, uh, you know, institutionally we've seen, not just under this administration, but uh, certainly uh, preceding it. Um, but again, I think it's very hard until there's a, is, there's a coordinating mechanism or a way of doing that in a more sophisticated fashion to see a political context uh, that overlays in a more strategic way these very kind of short-term transactional relationships, whether they're on economic issues or security issues. Um, the second thing I would just say is that there needs to, uh, at least in my view, and I know we're supposed to be talking about the big three, but when you look at the external actors beyond that, I think there's a great need for a much more robust transatlantic dialogue on some of these issues, right? Uh, our European partners have a very, uh, have a different but related set of interests here. Um, this is, as I said, obviously a very volatile region. It's a region, uh, when you just look at the Horn of Africa, whose population is going to grow by 40% um, uh, in the next 15 years and by 105% by 2050. Uh, that should all give us pause again about the risks that we're dealing with here, um, both at a security level and, and certainly on an economic level. Um, and then finally, I would just say that I think, uh, you know, it is, it is a fraught environment, uh, and uh, I think it, it's very important, the discussion that you've constructed here today about uh, economic issues. I think we shouldn't underestimate, however, uh, the challenging security environment that we face given these different uh, trend lines and, uh, and how they intersect and, uh, and the absence of real, uh, real strong long-term thinking about how to manage these trends. I think uh, we saw just, uh, just this week um, the, uh, the Houthis in Yemen uh, shoot a missile at a Saudi uh, oil tanker in the Red Sea, right? Um, and that happened to be at a slightly wider part of the Red Sea off the coast of Hodeida, but there's a very narrow stretch that, uh, that is the opening of the, uh, of, of the Red Sea going up to the Suez Canal under which hundreds of billions of dollars of trade uh, that is vital to Europe, vital to the United States, uh, and vital to Asia goes through every year. Uh, and, you know, when we're talking about being able to close off that, uh, that seaway uh, with vital economic uh, interests, with a few missiles uh, and no shortage of armed groups on either side, with those capacities, um, I think it should all give us pause and, and, and hopefully uh, continue uh, impetus to, to discuss these issues and try to uh, collectively figure out how we can confront those challenges. So I'll stop there and thank you again. Thank you so much, Peyton. I think the only thing I would add, and this was interesting that I was um, looking at as I was doing my research on this, that the Gulf exports to Sub-Saharan Africa were 19.2 billion in 2014, while the imports were 5.5 billion. Mm. Another area, and perhaps Carlton, you can speak to this when you, uh, given your background in agriculture, is the heavy investment that the Gulf countries are making in food security. Uh, and that, that's a really massive um, investment uh, for them, but that they're also increasingly investing in the extractive industries, real estate, private investment banking, tourism, and education. And in fact, what they're trying to do is they've been very successful in education and tourism in North Africa, and they're trying to push uh, down to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in those sectors, and perhaps b both of you can, can talk about that. But what I thought was really interesting that I, I don't know much about was the growing private equity and direct investment. That the Qatar National Bank, for e example, buying 23% of uh, EcoBank in, in, in Togo, and the 300 million plus investment in uh, Dangote Cement. Uh, I think those are, are, those are really big. 
and then there was talk, and I'm not enough of a good economist to know what this means, but uh, there was talk about the Islamic compliant bonds that are apparently gaining in popularity across the continent, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't know enough about that or what that means uh, in terms of that economic engagement, but perhaps uh, other members of the panel here can talk about it. Having said all of that, Carlton, over to you. Let's hear about Japan. Thank you very much, Mondi. Thank you, <coughs> everyone, um, for inviting me here. It's, it's great to be here, um, and I'm glad that I am, in fact, still awake, having arrived from Dar es Salaam this morning. Um, uh, I also f find it a bit uh, interesting that I'm among very esteemed uh, acad academicians and thinkers, and, and I'm just the, the lowly trade economist who happens to be a partner at Deloitte. Um, and I think I, I bring a bit of a different perspective particularly because um, uh, as we're sitting in, in sub-Saharan Africa, we, we, we get a lot of interest from the private sector who's interested in, in inbound foreign direct investment into sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I reflect, you know, just on the topic alone, when we say, you know, beyond the big three, Africa's economic relations with these different, different countries, if you, if you just reflect y yourselves, you'd probably come to the same conclusion that that the, the United States um, has rarely, if ever, been a traditional trading partner with the subcontinent. Um, uh, Europe has been, mainly because of, uh, of, uh, of uh, colonial um, reasons. Um, and China is um, most recently now, simply because of its, its uh, um, voracious appetite for, for um, consuming natural resources. Um, so then you look at some of the other countries that we're talking about. India, as, as was already mentioned by the, by the good doctor, has a very strong diaspora relationship already with the continent, with over two million people there. Um, the Gulf states, likewise, um, has a has a, a religious affiliation. That even um, in Tanzania, where I live now, we see a lot of uh, um, trade and investment that takes place with Oman and with other um, er, uh, countries, also in. Um, in the Gulf regions. Um, with Turkey, likewise, we see a lot of uh, investment um, and interest in the textiles and apparels, and indeed we see a lot of uh, a small, medium enterprise uh, engagement, and we'll also hear from Brazil as well, which, which has a Lusophone connection as well. B um, so when you look at China, you wonder, well, how do they fit into this? They're uh, amongst their uh, Asian competitors are much smaller, much smaller than India, much smaller than, than China. Um, but what we find with, with Japan is are some, some interesting dynamics, and I'll just kind of talk about a few of them now. I think first t to think about um, perhaps two different dimensions. One is on the ODA side, um, and then the second is on, on the kind of the private sector engagement side. So, so on the ODA side, J Japan, um, through its, its government institutions and, and whether it was before with, with JICA um, and now with JBIC, um, have been thinking about how they can provide um, not just humanitarian but but um, kind of development assistance to the subcontinent. Um, and when I say the subcontinent, I mean you know sub-Saharan Africa, um, not so much North Africa, even though there was some North Africa as well. Um, but in in sub-Saharan Africa, they kind of they had they had lumped their their development assistance in kind of two buckets. One was they called hard, and the other one was soft. And uh, may, perhaps it was just very poor translation from Japanese to English, but but in the in the the hard, um, it was mostly tied to things like infrastructure, helping really um, improve physical plant uh, on the continent. And so I'll come back to infrastructure in a moment because I think it's an area where they may not have such a, c a comparative or competitive advantage, uh, and it's quite crowded. Um, but on the hard side, you, you definitely saw a lot of that with with with, um, with uh, infrastructure investment, um, ports. Um, um, and focusing uh, a little bit kind of on their, their maritime strength. So they focused a lot on the ports and, and things like that. Um, and then on the soft side, it was really more just um, development assistance through humanitarian aid, um, trying to improve with education, trying to um, um, improve uh, the economic livelihoods of, of uh, the people on the subcontinent. Um, and I think it was a spill-off of their, their soft uh, development aid in, in the economic uh, activities that they realized that there was perhaps a broader opportunity for them to engage, um, not just from uh, bilateral donor, uh, you know, ODA, but also from, from the business community. And so what, what we find now, and we talk about this a bit in sub-Saharan Africa as we've moved a bit away from 
from Jabik Jaika, and we talk a lot more now about um, TCAD and Jetro, and I'll talk about those in a moment if, if you're not familiar with them. But And so what we're finding now is that it's the business community that's quite interested in trading in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, but to take a step back, let's just talk about the numbers. Um, again, as I mentioned, um, Japan is, is relatively small. I think it's between two and sometimes 5% of, of, uh, of the African, uh, um, their overall percentage of trade compared to other countries. Um, and so it's relatively small. Um, it, what industries, it's the typical ones that you would normally find, um, extractives, um, minerals, iron ore, and things of that nature are things that are getting exported from Africa to Japan and in return what comes back imported from Japan uh, into Africa is steel, um, is certainly a big one. Um, as you would imagine, automotive sector is also still quite large, um, not just new, but also secondhand. Um, in East Africa, where I live, it's, it's, it's the biggest thing that happens from Japan is, is the secondhand car market. Um, uh, what other things? So, so um, and but again, it depends on the countries, right? So you can lump them as was again already mentioned when we talk about fifty-four sub-Saharan countries. It's uh, sub fifty-four continental countries, fifty of them sub-Saharan. It's 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 very very difficult to kind of lump things together. So you'll find um, fossil fuels in some instances into the West. You'll find, as I mentioned, the automotive uh, and steel uh, imports and exports coming out from Southern Africa and from East Africa. Um, there has been a little bit of, uh, and, and, and it's growing somewhat, uh, trade in agricultural sectors, but it's still not so much. Um, and, and frankly, I don't think that Japan believes that it can actually um, compete in that space. So they really try to compete in areas where they think they can do much better. Um, and what we're finding is that the, the, cr the intersection between ODA and trying to improve um, uh, the, the hard assets and physical plant that comes from infrastructure, they've, they're now moving away from, from road rail ports to, to factories and, and providing skill that comes along with improving the industrialization of the subcontinent. Um, and that, I think, is, is an area where they, um, I think, are striking the mark right where it needs to be is because many sub-Saharan African countries, as they want to move into modernity, realize that they can either go the slow route, and that is become an agrarian society, become an industrial society, and then become an, uh, a knowledge society. Um, other countries like uh, Rwanda, which doesn't have that much natural resource, has tried to jump leapfrog into modernity already by becoming a knowledge economy. Um, and then others are somewhere in between. So Nigeria, um, Ethiopia is a, is a fantastic example. Um, uh, and even Tanzania and Kenya are realizing that industrialization is quite important to their own economic growth. Um, and they look to... Uh, the East, um, they look to the Asian Tigers, they look to South Korea, and they look to Japan for skills, um, for technology transfer from, from technical assistance that can help them and actually Im improve their own um, competency as well as productivity. And so we're seeing some, some gains there coming from that direction. Um, I think that uh, I, I mentioned before I wanted to talk just really quickly about, um, about TCAT. So the, the Tokyo International... Um, conference for African Development. The last, the, the f there have been six. The last one that occurred was in 2016. It was actually in Kenya, and I attended. Um, and it was the first time it was actually on the continent. And it was at, and it was at that event that uh, Senzo Abe actually committed 30 billion dollars, I think was the number, to 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 Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a ridiculously large number when they right now trade around eight and a half um, billion. Um, and so how do you do that? You can't do that just through development assistance. You actually have to, in fact, engage the private sector. And so what's been interesting about this is that there's, a, there's also a motivation on the Japanese side as well. What is that motivation? Some of it is tied to the fact that they have negative interest rates. And so um, if you're Japanese, it actually costs you more money to save than to spend. Um, and if you are a Japanese firm, the same rules apply. It's easier for you to actually get money from the bank and go and invest um, than it is for you to save and keep the cash and try to invest it in your own firm. So what we find, again, is a lot of inbound interest now from Japanese businesses looking to do joint ventures, greenfield and brownfield investments, um, and just looking for opportunity in sub-Saharan Africa. What's interesting, however, also is that they've got a long-term view. So unlike when we see um, private equity, um, even patient capital that comes from social 
um, you know, from 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 social or philanthropic fronts, um, the Japanese have a 25, 30 year view on their ROI. They're not necessarily looking for an immediate return on investment, but what they are looking for most importantly um, is risk mitigation. Um, and this we find fascinating because uh, the Japanese are, are very much interested in. Um, I don't want to call it saving face, but but is that me saying I'm done, <laughs> or is it someone else saying I'm done? <laughs> Two minutes. I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> thank you. So what I find uh, what we find interesting about Japan is is that um, is that reputational risk is is of utmost importance, and so uh, how does that impact their investments? It impacts their investments in that um, they really need to look for formalized businesses. These formalized businesses usually should be trading. If they're not trading, they need to have pretty sound audited financials because it needs to be able to, the companies need to be able to invest in a firm that they know um, will not blow back on them in years time. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is very different from China. It's even very different from India. Um, and that, th that the Japanese are looking for a very, very sound, strong kind of track record of, of, of success and stability before them to invest in. And they're willing, again, to take 20 years before they get their return on it. Uh, but I find that interesting. So now, um, finally, just kind of recommendations. I, I think um, I think there are several just lessons learned. Again, first th the first lesson learned for any of the other big three is, again, twinning. I think the United States can do a much better job of twinning um, their development assistance with, with, um, with business, um, most um, as, as an American, but having lived in Africa now nonstop for the last 12 years, but off and on for the last 20, um, America's tight aid is, is, is a challenge for African countries. And so um, they find it refreshing when they can, they can um, they're still bad deals, but they, <laughs> they like the deals that they get from China because they don't see it as tight aid. Um, they're uh, becoming more and more interested in, in, in opportunities with, with Japan because, again, it's looking to actually help build, build their economies. Um, so I think there's a there's a there's a lesson learned there, and then secondly, we've talked a bit about security, and I think that we shouldn't um, overlook the fact that um, security can also be addressed from economic points of view. So if we provide um, an economic platform for job creation and for wealth creation on the continent, it should actually help dispel some of the challenges we've had with security, and I think that's um, something that we should be thinking about. And then thirdly, is I think they need to pick. Maybe a recommendation for Japan, and I, I think they should probably get out of infrastructure when you've got everybody else there with the African Development Bank and the U.S. with Power Africa and others. It's just a crowded space, uh, and I think they'd be best served, I think, focusing more on helping the continent industrialize. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Right on point. So... <laughs> you oh, I was good on time. You were good on time. You were pushing it just a teeny <laughs> bit, but you were good. I good. Dr. Christina. Over to you, let's hear about Brazil. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the Wilson Center. It's really a great honor to be here. Um, and it, it was a pleasure listening to the interesting presentations of my fellow speakers. As um, we learned, time is short. Um, I'm gonna start right away with my case study on Brazil's Africa engagement and the nature, scale, and scope of its relations with the continent. To begin with, um, Brazil's relations with Africa, despite often being seen in the light of BRICS engagement in the continent, are far from being a recent phenomenon. In fact, the relationship um, dates back to primeval times, when Brazil and Africa were still united as one continent, the ancient supercontinent of Gondwana. Four centuries of abominable slave trade also linked Brazil with its neighboring continent and uh, laid the foundations for Brazil's economic wealth and contributed to the fact that Brazil can call itself today the biggest African nation outside of Africa. Yeah. While this uh, cultural link um, has not really played a major role for Brazil's national identity before the presidency of Lula da Silva, it has been one of the cornerstones of Brazil's political and economic rapprochement with Africa since the early 2000s. Beginning in 2003, under the first presidency of Lula da Silva, Brazil demonstrated a rising interest in its neighboring continent and significantly stepped up its engagement in a great number of African states. 
17 new embassies were opened, increasing the number of Brazilian diplomatic representations to 37, which made Brazil actually one of the countries with the highest number of embassies on the African continent. Encouraged by the political and financial support of the Brazilian government, major Brazilian companies also started to look towards Africa. Trade with Africa quintupled in the first decade of the 2000s with petroleum dominating Brazil's imports and resource-rich countries like Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, leading the list of Brazil's most important trade and investment partners on the continent. However, if this clearly looks like the classical BRICS country pattern of seeking Africa's natural resources, Brazil's African engagement is actually not that one-sided as it might seem at first glance. Rather, um, this engagement with resource-rich states like Nigeria, Africa, uh, South Africa, Angola, um, is explained by the fact that Brazil itself is a resource-rich nation and it's an important producer of commodities. Therefore, its expertise lies exactly in the exploitation of natural resources and most of its biggest companies are, well, involved in precisely this field like the now infamous oil company Petrobras or the mining giant Vale. But looking beyond the role of natural resources, which um, by the way also dominated the picture so much because commodity prices were really high, Africa is an interesting trade and business destination for Brazil for various other reasons. As one of the world's major meat and poultry producers, Brazil is, for example, betting on Africa's rising middle class and their increasing hunger for meat. As one of the world's biggest agricultural producers, Brazil is eager to export its agricultural technology. Embraer, Brazil's aircraft manufacturer and the world's leader in small to medium range jets, has discovered Africa as its, its fastest growing market. And the Brazilian motor manufacturer, Veg, produces motors for trucks and tractors for the sub-Saharan market in its South African plant. In general, Africa is considered a continent with great potential for Brazilian exports, as the share of manufactured products is relatively high in comparison with other export destinations. And the African market is not as satisfied as Brazil's traditional export markets in Europe and the US. As such, the African market is being promoted as a potential growth market and even a way out of Brazil's domestic economic crisis. So is Africa Brazil's new favorite trade and investment partner then? Not really. Given the just mentioned characteristics of the African market, which as we know is not a single market, the Brazilian government is promoting Africa as an export and business destination. However, the resonance from the Brazilian business community has rather been cautious. Beyond the big Brazilian players, only very few companies have tried to enter the African market. And the big state near companies that did so have done, ha have done this only with the political support of the Brazilian government and with subsidized loans from the Brazilian Development Bank. What is more, those companies that have taken the step and, and have invested in African countries have found it quite hard to gain a foothold. In fact, almost all Brazilian companies that have started or expanded their activities in Africa during the peak of Brazil's Africa policy between 2005 and 2010 have started to withdraw from Africa. A number of major scandals, as well as the suspension of payments by Angola and Mozambique for Brazilian infrastructure products, projects, have made Brazilian companies ever more aware of the pitfalls of investing in new markets like Africa. So despite the ongoing promotion of Africa as a promising business opportunity by the government, 
the Brazilian Africa engagement is very likely to further decrease in the next years. The country's capacity to uphold its Africa activities is currently very limited due to its economic problems and the ongoing Lava Jato corruption investigation that banned most of the big Brazilian firms from seeking state loans for big investments abroad. As such, Brazil can currently not be considered a strong competitor for the big three. And in fact, there are very few friction points with these powers in Africa. I think Brazil's currently weak position actually opens up opportunities for cooperation. In the realm of development cooperation, this is already happening as Brazil is, uh, for example, cooperating with Japan um, or Germany in so-called triangle cooperation projects. In the business realm, such cooperation is relatively rare still, but joint ventures with other companies become more frequent. Um, as the example of uh, Brazilian Embraer and uh, US Boeing, or the joint venture between Brazil's mining giant Vale and uh, Japan's Mitsui in Mozambique demonstrates. Against this background, my recommendations for Africa and her international partners are relatively simple. Cooperate with Brazil. Brazil is currently very open for cooperation, especially with European countries and the US. Um, and this is in order to uphold at least part of its Africa engagement and remain with one foot in the door. And Brazil has much to offer to Africa as it has highly valuable expertise in tropical agriculture, mining, and other issue areas that are very crucial in order to tap Africa's economic potential. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you to all five of our speakers. Um, really appreciated your coverage of the different um, questions that we asked of you. So a lot of um, information was provided and I, I thank you all. What I want to do now is just open up uh, the Q&A. And so those of you who've been here know the rules of engagement. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, once you've been acknowledged, we'll bring you a mic. You have a minute to make your comment or raise your, or, or uh, make a comment or ask your question. Yeah. You have one minute to make a comment or ask a question, uh, identify yourself, the organization with which you're affiliated, if any, and the speaker to whom you are directing the question. I will take three questions at a time, and then we will give the speakers an opportunity uh, to respond before going uh, for another round. So with that, the floor is open. All right. Rosemary, I'm not going to start with you. I always start with you. Let me start over there. Um. I just wanted to uh, thank all the speakers, and I'm Dr. Amit Kumar from AAA International Security Consultants. I had uh, three questions. Uh, 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 one. Uh, one. Okay, I'll say I have three comments for three speakers. Uh, for Dr. Uh, uh, Gokern, uh, you mentioned very eloquently India's interests. Now, how, how much are India's interests governed by the one belt, one road uh, uh, kind of competition from China? and the scramble for influence uh, security and economic in the Indian Ocean Rim countries and the African countries in that Indian Ocean Rim. For, for Peyton, uh, you mentioned in terms of the um, kind of influence that the Gulf states have in the Horn, but what about the Gulf states influence in Nigeria and the ostensible support to Boko Haram many years ago? And again, for Clayton, uh, in terms of Japan, how much is Japan's foray into Africa governed by Chinese considerations? Because there's always been kind of a TikTok battle between China and Japan f forever, for as far back as we can remember. Thank you. All right, before I turn it over to the speakers, let me clarify. <laughs> right, I, I let you get in your three questions, but really uh, you just one question or one comment. Uh, so we can get in as many people as you can see, we have a lot of people here. So with that clarification, let me turn to the speakers now because we did get three questions. And so I will give you an opportunity to respond to the question that you were just asked. Dr. Gokhan, can we start with you? 
I need to turn this on? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, thank you for that question. I think uh, there's no doubt that the uh, Indian perspective on both the, its west coast and its east coast is going to be influenced, shaped, uh, constrained perhaps even by what China is doing in terms of its larger regional strategy. Uh, India has taken a pretty firm position on that issue and it is at this point not seeing itself as part of that overall process. So there is a, a sort of an antagonistic uh, sense there. Uh, but as I said, uh, you know, this is what the big players are doing in one way or the other. Uh, so the Chinese strategy is a big player strategy. It is, it is encompassing, it is very deep, it's very resource intensive. It comes with various risks both for, uh, on both sides of the fence. And in that situation, I think, as I said, the strategic characterization that I see as most appropriate is uh, to find the niche. Uh, are there going to be any niches left, I think is an issue, is a question. But I think that's what, as, uh, as a second tier player in the, in the larger scheme of things, uh, that's what you have to look for. That's what you have to nurture, cultivate, and, and take advantage of. Uh, so all of this is happening uh, with with these other things which uh, are going on around you, and I think that uh, it, it definitely is going to influence the way that uh, we think. Uh, but that doesn't mean that opportunities are all uh, sealed off. I think there is room to explore, there's room to coexist. Um, I, I'll just, I mean, it, it's a sort of a broad question, but I mean, I, and probably merits its own uh, session. But I mean, I, I just offer two quick thoughts. I mean, one, I think it speaks directly to something that I sort of alluded to earlier, which is that one of the challenges in the horn, but this is also true for sort of Nigeria and the Lake Chad Basin in general, is uh, the differing perspectives that the Gulf takes on uh, the role of political Islam in states and governance uh, and the different strains of that. And that is obviously <coughs> a new development. Uh, different states have invested in, in promoting different uh, viewpoints and perspectives on that for, for some decades, uh, including in Nigeria, uh, and we see that play out. The other thought I would offer is that, you know, I didn't uh, sort of uh, drone on about armed groups and proxy groups and things like that, but, um, you know, I think among, I, I obviously talked at some length in terms of the linkages between, you know, the Horn and the Gulf, but these uh, linkages and our sort of tendency to stovepipe different uh, political and security questions extends very much you know, throughout the Sahel, right? So um, you, know, you could take it even much more broader uh, view beyond the kind of, I was trying to expand the view a little bit, but you could expand it and should indeed, uh, all of us expand it uh, even further because very clearly uh, these dynamics also play out uh, further west further uh, to the north, uh, west into Libya, obviously, and, and across the board. So I mean, it, there's no end to the complexity of all of it, but, um, but you know, it's, it, it's a point very, very well taken. And is Japan uh, competing with China? Of course they are. Um, if, you, if you think back to some of uh, Japanese earlier um, ODA intervention, I think it was at that time to to try to um, assert itself and, and get get favor with with uh, get favor from developing countries as it was on the Security Council and so I think that they wanted to get that kind of political um, uh, capital that came along with their with their development assistance but you know do, do they actually believe that they can compete with China from a scale perspective no they can't um, and so they're not trying to they're really I think much more targeted with what they're trying to to achieve um, and it's more around their, uh, whereas in some, in some other instances, I would, I would, uh, hazard to say, um, there are more geopolitical reasons for the trade and not just economic reasons for the trade. And, and much, I think of, of Japan's reasons for trade are economic and less so geopolitical. And actually just on that point, I, I don't know if it, the whole, most of the countries that we've discussed here, one of their strategic goals is to get the African vote in the UN. And so I think that's just one of those things that goes uh, without saying for uh, most of these uh, partners. There are those who want the permanent seat on the UN uh, Security Council, but I think we can take it as a given that getting that African vote in terms of UN uh, decisions is something that all of these countries are concerned about. Uh, we can take it as a, as a given that for at least three of them, um, there's that interest in getting that permanent seat on uh, the UN. 
So that's a good point, and I think it's a point that's well taken. Now let me take the next round of three questions and really please restrict yourself to one question or comment, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next. So let me take the gentleman over here, the three right there next to one another. I'll come to you. I see you all. Uh, thank you. My question is for Dr. Stolt. Um, you mentioned that Brazil is looking for partnerships when it comes to engaging in Africa. Could you go over the extent to which Brazil is partnering with the U.S. at all, if, if it exists at all? Hi, um, my name is Audrey Williams with Turkish Heritage Organization. My question is for Dr. Tepecik Liolu, um, if you can hear me. Uh, and so my question is one thing I, I realized, um, I, I noticed that you didn't mention, uh, but that I observed when I was in Turkey uh, was a seemingly increasing presence of African students at Turkish universities. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, either from your re research perspective or if there are any um, students at Yashar University and uh, whether that um, is coming into play more and more with Turkey, sub uh, especially sub-Saharan African relations. Thank you so much for embarrassing me by pronouncing that so well. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Segero. I'm the president of Segero's International Group. We focus on small and medium businesses and agriculture. Looking at all your discussion, I'm an expert, an African expert who has lived on the ground on agriculture. How do we deal with the small and medium businesses? Thank you so much, Turkey. I would like to come to Turkey and uh, talk with you about the small your initiative. So how do we engage the small and medium businesses, which are the growth of country? We're talking about multilateral businesses and these are small companies that uh, can do business in small and medium business. So how do you see this happy happening in Africa? My grandson is in India. Africans take their children to India to school to learn better, and uh, we really appreciate you. So how is the collaboration? How are we going to work with you, especially small and medium businesses and agriculture for advanced uh, export, imports, and international markets? All right. So. Dr. Elam, you want to start, and then I'll bring it in. I did not have time to mention uh, this uh, about this education issue, but Turkey is actually using these scholarships uh, in order to increase its soft power in African countries. Those scholarships provided not only by the Turkish government, but also by other institutions like. Um, NGOs or Turkey's Directorate of Religious Affairs also provide scholarships to Muslim students uh, in different African countries. So it is an important component of uh, Turkey's both public diplomacy and Turkey's soft power. Uh, and the number of African study students in Turkish universities have uh, especially increased uh, after Turkey um, decided to accelerate its African opening. Uh, and at Yashar University, we have uh, many African students coming mostly from Nigeria and from Kano, I guess. Um, it's, it's a part of the deal between the uh, states and the university, I guess. But yes, Turkey is using those scholarships to increase its uh, image in the continent and uh, providing significant amounts of scholarship, both at undergraduate and graduate level. And uh, I think it has increased its uh, opportunities, especially after 2012. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I know Turkey has been providing a lot of scholarships to students from Somalia yeah. uh, as part of yeah. that uh, capacity building uh, exercise and its engagement with um, Somalia. Yeah. Somalia is a priority area, not only in the humanitarian field, but also at the education field as well. Okay. Yeah. So the question on Brazil. Um, yeah, U.S.-Brazilian cooperation. Um, there is actually a lot of interest on the Brazilian side um, for cooperation with the U.S., um, but there are not too many examples of cooperation that come to my mind now. So um, there's the one um, joint venture that I already mentioned in, um, in my presentation, um, the joint venture being built between um, the aircraft manufacturers uh, Embraer and uh, Boeing um, that want to um, uh, well join forces on the African market. Um, 
in the business realm, there are no other examples that come to my mind. Mm. Whether um, in the um, development realm, there's um, a big cooperation going on between, um, um, well, um, the Brazilian um, foreign ministry or um, corporation agency um, and the Gates Foundation, uh, both in um, agricultural cooperation um, and in uh, health cooperation, uh, uh, especially in uh, the fight against AIDS in, in Africa. So, um, yeah. Uh, in business, uh, I would say there's still a lot of potential um, um, to to be tapped. Um, in the development realm, there's already a lot going on uh, between those two countries uh, in Africa. Um, and then let me just make one uh, short remark on, on the small uh, and medium business um, opportunities uh, in, in Africa. I think for the Brazilian case, um, it's it's not really targeting on uh, small and medium business. Um, the reason for that is uh, that there's a shortage or a lack of, of capital um, for those small and medium companies. Um, it's, it's for this reason that it's been only the large players, the um, state near companies, Petrobras, the um, oil company, Vale, the, um, the mining company, um, civil construction um, companies like Odebrecht, um, not all, uh, well, most of them not state owned, but really state near. And they um, can get um, subsidized loans from the development bank. If you don't have this access, and small and medium business is too small um, to, to get those loans, um, you won't get enough capital to, to go abroad. And, and actually, Brazilian business is very risk averse. Um, they are not really interested in, in going abroad at, at this size. They're not really internationalizing. Um, they like, like to keep to their um, well, big um, Brazilian domestic market, uh, which is actually quite protected. There's not that much competition going on. So um, so why go abroad and, and take risks? Um, so uh, I, do I don't see much potential for those small and medium-sized companies. For All right. Thank you. Let me just ask Carlton. I know agriculture is your thing, right? So I'm, I'm ho I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, but I hope you can uh, chime in on, on that question on uh, SMEs and medium-sized enterprises and agriculture in particular. And Dr. Gokan, I know you wanted to uh, add something to that as well. So let's just bring it in. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so to echo the remarks that were just made already, I think there's a couple of things one must recognize. And, and, and firstly, it's that um, small, medium enterprise are just that, small. And for an investor, um, it's very difficult for them to, to find a justification to do any sort of investment in a small, medium enterprise when in fact that it, that that organization business, if you want to call it that, um, um, has very little absorptive capacity to actually accept whatever investment is coming their way. Not to mention the fact that many small medium enterprises are family owned enterprises themselves, and really they're looking for debt. Um, th they basically just want a better rate than they can get from the bank. They're not looking for equity, um, or when they want equ when they want an equity investment, it's um, give me a whole lot of money and I'll give you one percent share. <laughs> So that's not true <laughs> equity investment, right? So, so you find that as an issue on the SME side. Now, on the agricultural side, I think also um, we, we must also recognize that, that uh, first to recognize that, that African agriculture is, is, is the backbone of the GDP of the continent. Um, it is largely um, women uh, who produce the food that we all eat, um, but it's men who own the land. Um, the women have no land tenure. So with no land tenure, they also don't have any access to finance. So again, you have a struggle there when you have um, the laborers themselves and the women um, can till the land, farm the land, and take it to the market, and then they get the money and they have to give it to the husband. Um, and so it's a big challenge. So um, now what have we been doing? We've seen a lot of, um, of bilateral and multilateral uh, development assistance in the agricultural space, and it will continue. Um, 
um, taking a book out of the, the Green Revolution that occurred in India. There are a lot of uh, um, um, technical assistance um, projects that are in, in doing in crop intensive, all along the agricultural value chain with, with, um, with uh, crop intensification, with trying to improve yields, with, with uh, improving the, the variety of the seeds and inputs that go into the ground, with trying to do a better job of commercializing Afri uh, African agriculture, um, a lot of things are happening and they will continue to happen. I think one of the things that we probably must ask ourselves is, is why do we continue to romanticize the smallholder farmer in Africa when, in fact, if I were to ask um, even some of my own family who was there and say, well, if, if you had an opportunity to till your half hectare of land um, to feed yourself, or if I put a shoe factory one kilometer from your village, where would you rather be? And they would all pick the shoe factory. So we need to also make sure that we recognize that um, in some instances, African agriculturalists do so for livelihoods. They don't actually do it because they want to have a business out of it. They do it because there's no other way for them to eat. Um, but now when we find um, business-oriented or those that are, I don't want to call it business-oriented, but, but slightly more commercial than your traditional agriculturalists, um, we are... There's lots of investment. In fact, lots of investment coming from Indian firms, um, the likes of uh, Export Trading Group in East Africa, Olam in West Africa. Um, there's a lot of uh, agricultural investment opportunity that occurs on the continent and will continue. Dr. Goldfein? Uh, thank you. I just want to address the question of SMEs, and I think it's a very important example of uh, complementarities because it's unlikely that you will have foreign investment coming into SMEs for reasons mentioned. But uh, investment in creating a facilitating framework or facilitating environment, I think, is very important. So let me give you just two examples. One is logistics. I mean, I think the one, one key factor in the success of, of uh, SMEs is market access. And there you do have, within Africa, you have uh, you know, uh, customs unions and so on. That's one factor. But in order to exploit those larger expanded market opportunities, you need very, very good logistics. And that's, I think, an area where foreign investment does tend to to come in, assuming that state policy, that, that uh, policy is, is conducive. The second one, which is very important, I think we're seeing this play out in India uh, very significantly now, is uh, some mechanism of aggregation. Uh, if you look at US history, for example, the role that uh, the department store chains played in aggregation, so that you know you, they, they were able to, to bridge the gap between very geographically scattered producers and, and some domestically at first and then internationally and cus and consumers and you know that that mechanism is very very important in being able to facilitate sme viability uh, what that role is now being played by e-commerce uh, companies in in india uh, we have amazon a foreign company we have flipkart an indian company both of them you know going at it uh, uh, hammer and tongs to try and create national markets but their sourcing is is phenomenally wide and their reach in terms of distribution is phenomenally wide. So a customer in, in the far north of the country could very easily be buying a product that was produced you know, 3,000 kilometers away and not paying a very significant price for it in terms of uh, the, the, the premium because these companies have mastered the logistic, uh, the transportation, and the delivery mechanisms. So somebody's got to be playing that aggregation function. Maybe an online, you know, an e-commerce mechanism. It may be something else. But unless we have that as a way to exploit uh, the logistic uh, capacity, SMEs are going to be confined to their local markets, and that's really not a uh, not uh, something that's going to give them much much traction. Uh, there are of course business specific things like finance, but that those are well known issues. I think here is a question of seeing new opportunities through aggregation that uh, we are seeing the benefits of in several situations. I think that's where we have to be exploring uh, these. You know what role do foreign in investors play? What role does does a good state policy play? Thank you. All right, let me take three more. I'll take the gentleman over there, go over there, and then over here. Right here, the gentleman right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucio Pitlo, uh, intern at Wilson Center. So um, Japan and India were cooperating for this Asia Africa Growth Corridor. Uh, I was wondering why it was not covered but it was like uh, infrastructure support for African countries. Now, in relation to that, um, so ma many African countries have expressed concern about uh, debt accumulation and about potential loss of control of strategic assets or utilities that you know, some 
uh, especially with, with China. This is a concern raised by some African countries in relation to their uh, engagement with China. Uh, how is Japan trying to assuage or to handle this issue with, with their African partners? Thank you. All right, you snuck in too, but that's all right. <laughs> I'll get to my brother back there. My name is Yaya Fanusi with the United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. It always amazes me that at this time I will be listening to something, talk that we stopped talking about 30 years ago. <laughs> they are going to be continent-wide political federation 2020, and it will solve all the constraints that you all are talking about. You can scale. When you meet Dangote, ask him if he will be opposed to the United States of Africa project. All right. The gentleman right across. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my question will um, go to most of the presentation uh, given here about um, the fate of Africa. So when we hear about Africa, we tend to believe that it's uh, a federal or a, a federation or a, an organization governed by a great leadership. Uh, that unfortunately uh, is not the case. So we, uh, through all the presentation, so I'm still left unsatisfied when it comes to the pathways uh, to development. So I am sorry for not um, getting the name right. So um, my question will go to uh, the, the gentleman in, in the middle who talked um, intensively about the security issues in, in, in Africa. So I, I, I tend to believe that there is no pathway to development uh, if the question of security, the challenge, the security challenge in Africa is not, uh, is not um, uh, taken care of uh, successfully. So we, in, in, in countries, so oh, are, are we oh, sorry, what, what's your question? Can you, let's get to the question so they can actually respond to it. No, my question is, so how can, how can we have a coordinated response? So listening to all the presentation, even Helen from Turkey was recommending that uh, Turkey, sh uh, Turkey should um, uh, 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 a help in terms of uh, the fight against terrorism in, in Africa. But so how can we get to a successful uh, response, to a coordinated and a very efficient response to, to, to deal with the problem? And the gentleman from- uh -uh, One question, you got your question is. I think your question is, the speakers have raised an uh, array of really difficult issues and challenges yes. uh, that are going to require some sort of coordinated response in order to be able to realize the results that people want to see for the continent. Right. And so what are their thoughts on how we get to that position of a coordinated response? I think your question may be directed to the wrong panel. <laughs> I think that's a question that's rightfully addressed to African leaders in many ways. I mean, I'm sure they can, no, I, I'm going to turn it to them, but in terms of the comprehensive overall response, my position is Africa has to define her strategic interest. Africa has to decide how it's going to safeguard those strategic interests, even as it engages with all these partners that have just been yeah, uh, described I, here. I will, agree with your, uh, I will agree with your suggestion, but what I, 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 I really want to, to point out is whatever... Uh, the solutions are the economic uh, pathways are in Africa. We want to get we want to get to to, to a development as long as uh, the f uh, the challenge in terms of uh, terrorism financing okay. is. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, he's not there to successfully. Thank you, Sophie. All right, so three, no, there was somebody else. No, we had three questions. The Japan-India cooperation and um, the serious concerns about the increasing debt accumulation uh, in, uh, in Africa, and then this African fear that many have about the loss of control of strategic assets, particularly when it comes to engagement with with China and how can um, we avoid that with, I think it was with Japan, with in, in Japan's case. Uh, the second question was really a comment. Right, Yaya, there's no need for a response for that. <laughs> About the United States of Africa, it's a work in progress. You and I know that, so let's just uh, comment noted. Um, then pathways to Development. Your larger question is about how can we get a better handle on addressing insecurity and conflict on the African continent, right? All right, so I'll turn it over. What I'm gonna do here, because we are actually, I'll give a minute to each of our speakers. Now just one minute, pick one of those and answer one, and then we'll, we'll bring the event to a close. So Dr. Ellen, why don't you go, your one minute. I, if I understood correctly, the question was not directed to me, actually, but to all the participants there, right? To all the presenters, I guess. Well, in order to um, contribute to Africa's development, I guess, what in, in what terms Turkey could contribute, uh, it would be more uh, in, could be more in humanitarian area and more in the um, military sector, I guess, because as I have mentioned earlier, Turkey tries to increase its soft power in the continent uh, through using uh, many different instruments, including uh, humanitarian assistance, development aid, and via both local, via both NGOs, public institutions, business groups, etc. But um, Turkey also seeks to increase its military. Um, presence in the continent. For example, last year it set up its largest overseas army base in Somalia in, with, in aiming to train Somalian troops. So this would be the uh, okay. this would be the one possible area where both sides can mutually benefit from each other's experience. But in other fields uh, like uh, contributing to Africa's development um, Turkey might not be the right actor right now. Maybe a decade later, but you know, uh, as the other uh, speakers uh, talked earlier, um, like Brazil is having economic problems right now. Turkey is busy with other internal issues, like having its own um, fight with terrorist organizations, both within its borders and in its neighborhood. So. Okay. Maybe more than a decade later, it might contribute uh, better to Africa's development in the economic field, but after solving its own problems in this field, I guess. All right, thank you. Dr. Christina, your one minute, pick a question. Um, well, I, I picked the question on um, development, mm -hmm. um, which, which was a topic I didn't focus so much on um, because I felt uh, the focus here was um, much more business and investment um, of uh, Brazilian business in, in uh, Africa. Um, but actually, Brazil has approached the African continent much more in, in, uh, in a political sense and in, in uh, terms of South-South cooperation and very much focusing on um, development issues. Um, so, yeah, um, we don't have time to elaborate on that, um, but I can tell you um, there, um, there is a lot of stuff to, to look into. Um, Brazil has been a very important um, development partner for Africa. In terms of uh, security, um, Brazil is also approaching the continent, um, putting focus on the, the South Atlantic, um, cooperating with uh, South Atlantic um, Western African states, uh, in terms of uh, security cooperation, combating um, piracy, um, and, and so on. So um, there's a much broader spectrum of um, activities um, and engagement of Brazil um, and Africa going on um, than that uh, that I have mentioned so far. All right. Thank you. Carlton? Uh, don't own and operate your assets. I think that's the way that you can assuage um, African fears 
that their infrastructure is being taken over by benefactors. Well, uh, what do I mean? I think that when we when we when we see China come, China comes with a mighty village, <laughs> very large entourage. Um, they bring everything when they come to do an in infrastructure project. Now we also see good examples, like in the Ethiopia light rail, where there is some skill transfer. Um, but still, that that light rail system, the, the Ethiopians will be paying for for a while, uh, paying back to China for a while. Um, so I think that uh, um, the tactic should be there just that. It's, it's just try not to allow it to be an own and operate system when when an infrastructure project is is being planned. Okay, Peyton. Um, I mean, I think on this question of conflict and security and development, uh, I think one of the things that we need to uh, emphasize more uh, is political solutions to addressing these issues in the long term. We tend, not just in the West, but I I on the continent as well, to overemphasize, at least in my view, technical solutions to what are fundamentally political problems, right? So that includes humanitarian responses, it includes development responses, it includes peacekeeping responses, all of which are important, but they're not sufficient, actually. Uh, and we tend to, at least in recent years, uh, not, I think, uh, pay due attention uh, and invest uh, as much as we should in political solutions. And that gets, without getting bogged down into a discussion of the African peace and security architecture, it gets directly to this issue of regional integration that has come up in various forms, right? And uh, it's no surprise that the region that I was talking about primarily, the Horn of Africa, is the least, uh, or I think the least, uh, <laughs> maybe not the, uh, maybe there's a close runner up, um, the least integrated of the regions on the continent, right? And so it's not a coincidence that it's also one of the more conflict uh, prone and, and conflict ridden, right? Because of the absence of these mechanisms for addressing uh, these issues. So, um, you know, having said that, this is, is obviously I'm not the only person to recognize this point, and there's a very uh, vibrant uh, African uh, discussion about these issues, not just in the Horn, but throughout the continent, and that's exactly where that discussion um, belongs. Um, and, you know, uh, those folks engaged in that conversation deserve great credit for trying to drive that forward. And that includes within the Horn, it includes these questions of integration, and it includes, you know, how a more integrated region is best able to defend, as you suggested, Linda, its strategic interests against those who basically, external actors who are just willing to, you know, go for uh, whoever's, uh, you know, the highest bidder, the lowest bidder, whatever is most conducive to their own interests, right? Thank you. Dr. Gokren, bring us home. Uh, <coughs> the question of the, the Indo-Japanese collaboration, I, I'm, I'm not, commenting specifically on that because it's not really in my radar screen now. Uh, but I think the general strategic point I was making about whether two smaller players and we're sort of classifying all of the countries that we represent as the smaller players, you know, uh, for better or for worse, uh, can they combine to replicate the strategy of a big player? And I think these initiatives perhaps demonstrate that it's not so easy to do that. Uh, there is a scale issue besides which there are coordination issues between two very disparate uh, parties, uh, what sort of resource commitments are you willing to make, what sort of uh, thresholds do you apply for, for you know, the hurdle rates of return and so on, what are the metrics by which you measure it. All of these are very, very complicated issues. And I think what is happening, and I think I, I, I certainly learned that from all of the, all of the country uh, cases that we've heard today, uh, that ultimately the smaller players are in their own way, in each one in their own way, looking for niches. That that is the that is I think the way in which uh, a small player strategy is going to work is is don't try and imitate don't try and replicate you're not you know you, you're either the resource commitments are too high or you're starting way too late uh, so look for the gaps in which you can fit look for the ways in which you can make yourself uh, uh, you know heard and and uh, appreciated and uh, I think that's that's the way that these countries are going about it. Uh, and I think there's a great commonality that that has come out of the panel. That uh, you know, niching I think is the one uh, common theme that I at least I've picked up. Maybe my my own sort of uh, preconceptions, but that's that's what I'm I'm understanding from what I'm hearing. Well, thank you, and that's a very good point to bring this uh, to a to 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 a close. Uh, we've covered some really really good ground uh, here, important ground, key issues that I'm just sorry we didn't have more time to dig deeply in, uh, into some of them. But I think, let me conclude in this specifically addressing my African brothers in the back over there. 
uh, that I think what you hear from this panel is just the increasing and complex engagement that various international actors have uh, with the continent. I hear your concern. It's not that I don't hear it. And I think in many ways what we just heard today, not because it's wrong, what we heard today is a clarion call to African countries to step back, understand their own strategic interests and figure out how best to engage. I think that's point number one. Point number two has to do with this mission. Actually, it was a point you made before that. I'm not even sure that uh, from an African perspective that your ordinary African citizen would want these new and upcoming partners to replicate what the bigger partners have done in Africa. So I think that's a key point. That just because somebody's doing it doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, the best approach. And so I think, again, another layer of interrogation that we need to undertake. The third and final point I'm going to make is this. I think I heard security come up a number of times. And that's a key point. It's fundamentally a governance problem that you have, and that's something that African leaders and African people are going to have to address. It is fundamentally this lack of integration and cooperation that Peyton was talking about. I mean, his point is right. The Horn of Africa, the least integrated and for my money, probably the most undemocratic region on the continent. So then you wonder about how all of these pieces uh, fit together. So I think this is a nice setting and I think the speakers did a fantastic job of out outlining the interests that are driving that engagement, the nature of that engagement. But I think this is also a call to African countries to hear this, to understand what's going on and figure out how they respond and engage. There are both challenges and opportunities. I'm not saying this is bad. So how do you mitigate those challenges and amplify the opportunities from both ends? And so with that, join me in thanking our fantastic panel I also want to thank the Africa program staff, uh, my colleagues here at the Wilson Center, but most importantly, all of you for coming uh, to this discussion. Uh, you've all heard about the uh, Brown Capital Africa Forum. Our next discussion actually takes place on the 31st of May, and I hope many of you are going to come to that, because what that event is going to focus on is America First and Brexit, or what some see as the growing um, threat of econo economic nationalism and its impact on the global trade ap architecture and implications for Africa. So I invite you to please join us for that discussion as well. And so thank you again for coming. And um, for now, I'd like to invite our speakers to please stay on the stage and invite the rest of you to join us for a mini reception out there um, for about 30 minutes. The speakers will join you shortly. We'll have a photo up here and then they will come out and join you. I'd also like to invite the Brown Capital Management team to please come up for a photograph, and then we'll join everybody else. So thank you so much. <laughs>